morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Pranithi, and I just want to welcome everyone to today's Medicine Ground Rounds, where we'll be discussing opportunistic infections in HIV patients. Our speaker today is an infectious disease specialist from Southern Indiana University School of Medicine. So please welcome Dr. Vidya Prakash. Dr. Prakash graduated from the University of Cincinnati before completing her residency and fellowship in San Antonio, Texas. She's worn and continues to wear many hats to serve her community in various ways, from serving in the United States Air Force to being associate program director for internal medicine. She's also the founder and director of the SIU Alliance for Women in Medicine and Science, as well as a director for AMWA, the American Medical Women's Association, in addition to being a professor in both clinical internal medicine and infectious disease. She is a passionate mentor for women in science and medicine, as well as an amazing educator who we are very excited to have with us today. So as usual, the end will say 15 minutes for questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and I can read them at the end, or please come on mute and say your question live if you can. Uh, with that, I don't wanna to take too much time. So Dr. Prakash, go ahead, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Pranithi. Um, and I want to thank you and the Health for the World team for having me here. As I said before, it is really an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with you. And without further ado, we will start talking about opportunistic infections in HIV patients. And we have a lot of cases to cover, so I'm going to keep my introduction very brief. Um, and I'll start with the initiation of ART, or antiretroviral therapy in the mid-90s really, really reduced morbidity and mortality from opportunistic infections or OIs in HIV patients. So the question you'll ask is, you know, this many years later, why do we continue to struggle with opportunistic infections? So the problem is threefold. First, not all HIV infections are diagnosed. And a large proportion of those patients who haven't been diagnosed for many years may already have had substantial immunosuppression, which really contributes to the morbidity and mortality of OIs. The second piece is that not all patients with HIV receive ART or the care that they need and deserve. And then third, some patients may be on ART, but are unable to maintain virologic suppression which directly impacts morbidity and mortality from opportunistic infections. And a lot of that could be just because they're not taking the medication, so they're not adherent. There may be biological factors, unfavorable pharmaco pharmacokinetics, and the list goes on. The bottom line, though, is that opportunistic infections are associated with increased HIV viral load, especially in OIs like tuberculosis and syphilis, and we know that that accelerates HIV progression and increases risk of transmission. So, you know, I have the bullet here that says timely initiation of OI, OI chemoprophylaxis, but I will also add timely and appropriate therapy of OIs decreases OI-related morbidity, decreases the progression of HIV, and ultimately improves survival. So again, imperative to be able to diagnose and treat these and importantly prevent them. And really, it starts with getting patients on ART. So I like to, to use this chart as a reference. It's a quick reference of what HIV patients are most vulnerable to based on their CD4 counts. And we know at higher CD4 counts, typically greater than 500, you're going to see acute retroviral syndrome. So in any sexually active patient that you have, who presents with fever, rash, and either an exudative or non-exudative pharyngitis, you have to keep acute retroviral syndrome due to HIV in mind and really consider diagnosis through an HIV viral load. We do see candida vaginitis as well um, in patients with higher CD4 counts. It's when the CD4 count drops to the 200 to 500 range, you start seeing recurrent bacterial pneumonias, you start seeing pulmonary tuberculosis, herpes zoster, thrush, cryptosporidiosis, which is generally self-limited at that CD4 range, Kaposi sarcoma, which is due to HHV8, 
and then oral hairy leukoplakia, which is, which is associated with Epstein-Barr virus. When you're less than 200 is where you get pneumocystis pneumonia due to pneumocystis urovecchi disseminated fungal infection due to histoplasmosis and coccidioidomycosis. Now you see extra pulmonary TB, whereas with higher CD4 counts, slightly higher CD4 counts, you saw pulmonary TB, and then progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy due to JC virus, double-stranded DNA virus. As you get lower, less than 100, now you see disseminated HSV infection, infection due to toxoplasmosis, usually CNS, toxoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, again, which is CNS, chronic cryptosporidiosis. Remember at higher CD4 counts, it was more self-limited. As you drop, now you, it becomes more chronic. Microsporidiosis, which we'll talk about, and then now candida involvement of the esophagus. And finally, when you get to below 50, now you see disseminated mycobacterium avium complex, and then disseminated CMV infection. So I hope this chart is useful as a quick reference because it really helps you to narrow your differential based on the patient CD4 count. And then I have this link to what's new in the guidelines, which takes you directly to guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of opportunistic infections in HIV patients. I'd like to keep this case-based, so I want you just to consider this case. We have a 29-year-old student with HIV. Their CD4 count is 190. So again, we're below 200. Viral load of 75,000, who complains of a dry, non-productive cough for three weeks along with low-grade fever. Patient has not seen a physician in several years and is not on ART or any other medications. So she is febrile on exam, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, tachycardic, Blood pressure is 115 over 70, respiratory rate 20. Lung exam is unremarkable. Chest x-ray is normal. But an ABG shows a pH of 7.2, a PaCO2 of 34, and a PaO2 of 85. You see the silver stain here. So what diagnos diagnostically are you thinking? And what is the most appropriate treatment? So this is a case of pneumocystis pneumonia. And the correct answer choice is A, Bactrim. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. So pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP is still the acronym um, to describe pneumonia due to pneumocystis urovecchi, which is officially classified as a fungus, although it has protozoan characteristics. Um, and prior to ART and PCP prophylaxis, it affected the overwhelming majority of AIDS patients. Um, typically, with a CD4 count of less than 200, I've highlighted that. And know that risk factors for disease due to pneumocystis urovecchi are oral thrush, recurrent bacterial pneumonia, higher HIV viral load, and unintentional weight loss. And mortality untreated is up to 40%. So how did they present? Non-productive cough, dyspnea, fever, and chest discomfort. And unlike bacterial pneumonia, this is, which is generally a little bit more acute, PCP presents more subacute. So it progresses over days to weeks. It's this insidious cough, dyspnea, fever, and chest discomfort. Physical exam can oftentimes be normal. So don't exclude pneumonia in an HIV patient who has these symptoms based on a normal pulmonary exam. Um, certainly, if they're tachypnic or they're exerting themselves, you may hear dry rails. But remember, the majority of your patients are going to be febrile, and the majority will have some level of hypoxia, and it ranges from mild to severe. Elevated LDH is a huge clue that you may be dealing with PCP, generally on the order of 500. And as I said, you'll have moderate to severe hypoxemia. Chest x-ray, again, like your physical exam, it may be normal. So don't exclude pneumonia in these patients solely based on the physical exam and the chest x-ray. Um, when they are abnormal, uh, you'll typically see these diffuse bilateral interstitial infiltrates. And I will tell you that even if a chest x-ray is normal, if you get a CT, it will the majority of the time be abnormal. Um, atypical presentations radiographically of PCP include nodules, pulmonary nodules or cysts, 
you can see pneumothorax, and you can see cavitary disease and pleural effusion. And up to 18% of patients will have a concurrent bacterial pulmonary infection, um, either bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, or uh, infection due to Kaposi's sarcoma, which we will talk about later. So diagnosis is based on either histopathologic evidence in tissue, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, or an induced sputum. Don't ever get a random sputum culture. It must be induced. Um, random, randomly expectorated sputum has very low sensitivity. And you send it for a GMS stain, which is what is seen here, this Gamori methenamine silver stain, where you actually see, see staining of the cyst walls. Um, the respiratory specimen sensitivity, again, depends on the specimen, right? So an open lung biopsy specimen, obviously it's the most invasive, but the most sensitive, 95 to 100%. Transbronchial biopsy is similar. Bronchoalveolar lavage is 90 to 99%. And induced sputum, which as I said, is really much better than a randomly expectorated sputum. It really depends on the quality of the specimen and the experience of the microbiology lab. So you have between less than 50% to up to 90% depending on those factors. Treatment of PCP, trimethoprim, sulfamethox is always the treatment of choice and it's generally a higher dose. So Bactrim double strength, two tabs, P-O-T-I-D. And if you're going to do it IV or inpatient, it's 15 mg per kg of the trimethoprim component and you divide that every eight hours daily. When do you use steroids? You look at the PaO2. If it's less than 70 on the ABG or your AA gradient is greater than 35, those are indications for corticosteroids. And you usually want to start it within 72 hours of starting PCP therapy. Starting it later than this, it's unclear benefit, but you still probably should go ahead and do it anyway. Um, and then, you know, once they're out of their acute illness, you want to taper that prednisone for 21 days. Um, and so you're going to treat with the steroids if you choose to treat with steroids and the Bactrim for 21 days total. Now, when is the timing of your ART? Remember, I said of paramount importance and central to treatment and especially prevention of OIs is starting ART, generally within two weeks of starting PCP therapy. And while they're on concomitant PCP therapy and ART, really look for the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. When you think about this or iris, remember their immune system was suppressed for so long, suddenly you give them their immune system back and their immune system is amped up in order to take care of the infection. And so you can see infection-like symptoms from fever to chills to even lymphadenopathy, which is really indicative of the immune response. Iris is a diagnosis of exclusion though. So you want to make sure you do a thorough infectious workup, exclude all other sources of this febrile response. And if you're left with nothing else, then you have your iris as your diagnosis of exclusion. And ART, in addition to your Bactrim or whatever it is that you use for PCP, you have to look for drug toxicities as well. So those are the two words of caution when you start concomitant PCP treatment or you start concomitant ART treatment with PCP therapy. Alternatives, let's say the patient has anaphylaxis to Bactrim or your Trimsulfa, then what are your alternatives? For mild to moderate disease, you can use a combination of Dapsone and Trimethoprim, um, which certainly won't work in the case of allergy. Um, but other alternatives include a combination of primaquin and clindamycin um, and atovaquone, although the caveat to atovaquone is that it's not as good as Bactrim for mild to moderate disease. When you're going into moderate to severe disease, don't use atovaquone. It's not as effective. You really need to be using either primaquin and clindamycin, or as a last resort, you can use IV pentamidine, but it's not as well tolerated as your primaquin and clinda, and there are lots of side effects uh, that are associated with pentamidine. It includes dysrhythmias, hypoglycemia, and acute kidney injury. So keep that in mind. 
prevention. So when do you start PCP prophylaxis? If the CD4 count is less than 200 or less than 14% percentage um, or any history of an AIDS defining illness, you start PCP prophylaxis. If they're above 200, but less than 250 and not on ART, and you can't monitor that CD4 count every couple of months to see when it drops below 200, go ahead and start PCP prophylaxis. Preferred choice is Bactrim. You can either do it daily um, or you can do it three days a week. And again, if they can't tolerate Bactrim, you can use Dapsone, aerosolized pentamidine, um, or atovaquone. Now, why stop prophylaxis? Why not continue it indefinitely? You're reducing the pill burden. You're reducing likelihood of drug toxicity. It's less costly, and you're not propagating drug resistance. And you can safely stop PCP prophylaxis when A, they are on ART, and their CD4 count is greater than 200 for at least three months. I'm gonna move on to question two. So now you have a 35-year-old female with HIV, CD4 count is 90, viral load is 100,000. So now the CD4 count is less than 100. Poorly compliant with ART and her OI prophylaxis brought in by her father due to headache, confusion, and fever. And this has been going on just for one week. So on exam, she's febrile, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, heart rate of 97, blood pressure 112 over 78. She's only alert and oriented to self and she's confused. There's really no nuchal rigidity on exam and the rest of her neurologic exam is normal. And you see her head CT shown to the right. Um, so this is a T1 weighted image where you see attenuation in the thalamus bilaterally. So what is the most likely diagnosis here? In the interest of time, I will tell you this is a case of toxoplasma encephalitis. So toxoplasma gondii, unlike pneumocystis, which is officially classified as a fungus, this is a protozoal disease. At least in the United States, the prevalence is 15%. And again, PCP, you think less than 200. Toxoplasmosis, think less than 100. Although the greatest risk is in those with a CD4 count less than 50. And so what is the life cycle of toxoplasmosis? So you have oocysts that are excreted in the feces of cats um, and through fecal oral contact, um, you get it, the, the human beings, they ingest the oocysts and then they change into the rapidly replicative form tachyzoites. And then after they replicated and potentially infected the fetus, if the patient is pregnant, it then embeds itself into tissue, including the CNS tissue in the form of a bradyzoite. Humans can also get toxoplasmosis by ingesting tissue cysts of infected mammal, um, animals um, that are also infected uh, by cats. And so it embeds itself in the tissue cysts in the bradyzoite form, the humans ingest it, it then forms into tachyzoites, which again rapidly replicate and then embed themselves into human tissue with a predilection for the CNS. And again, this is usually a reactivation disease in immunosuppressed patients like AIDS patients. So how does this present? It's a focal encephalitis, usually with headache, altered mental status, with weakness and fever, and it's usually a subacute presentation. Um, we're talking days to no more than a couple of weeks. Um, and can rapidly progress to seizures and coma. And when you look at imaging, MRI is your diagnostic mod modality of choice. You typically see multiple ring enhancing lesions with edema. You can also see solitary ring enhancing lesions, but I will say 75% of lesions are seen in the basal ganglia. Extracerebral toxoplasmosis can be seen. Can you see toxonumonitis? Yes. It presents similarly to PCP with the fever, non-productive cough, dyspnea, that's more subacute in presentation. And you can also see toxoporeoretinitis, which presents with eye pain, decreased visual acuity, and it's to be distinguished from CMV retinitis, which is typically in a vascular distribution. Toxoplasmosis, you see yellowish lesions in a non-vascular distribution on fundoscopic exams. 
Diagnostic testing. You can start with a positive IgG. Remember, a negative IgG makes toxoencephalitis highly improbable. So if you have a patient with a positive IgG with this clinical presentation, chances are you're dealing with toxoplasmosis. A definitive diagnosis requires certainly the, the clinical syndrome in an AIDS patient with the CD4 count less than 100, one or more mass lesions seen on CT or MRI, plus organisms seen on brain biopsy. And we'll talk in a little bit how often we do brain biopsy. Toxoplasma, PCR, and CSF can be helpful. It's very specific, but only 50% sensitive. So a negative test does not rule it out. I'm going to take a step back. In addition to toxoplasmosis, please consider the following other entities when you're thinking of focal neurologic disease in AIDS patients. Primary CNS lymphoma, tuberculosis can present like this, cryptococcosis, bacterial brain abscess, and then PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, although again, PML, which we'll talk about, is more white matter disease. We talked about the necessity for brain biopsy. Usually, if you have an AIDS patient with a CD4 less than 100 who presents with fever, headache, altered mental status, and you see these solitary or numerous ring-enhancing lesions, you're not going to immediately go for brain biopsy. You're going to treat empirically with pyrimethamine plus sulfadiazine plus what we call leucovorin rescue. Um, and only pursue brain biopsy if they fail to respond to therapy, which means clinical or radiographic deterioration during that first week, or if they're just not improving in the first couple of weeks. So pyrimethamine sulfadiazine represents the basis uh, for toxoplasmosis treatment. Um, pyrimethamine in particular really penetrating the brain well, but the leucovorin is on board to prevent heme toxicity. So pyrimethamine can really cause marrow suppression and the leucovorin helps to prevent that. And if you don't have pyrimethamine sulfadiazine, Bactrim is a reasonable alternative, which we're, we have used for PCP as well. Um, you can use a combination of pyrimethamine plus clinda plus leucovorin as well. And steroids should only be pulled out if there's mass effect uh, radiographically. And treatment is generally for six weeks and you monitor how they're doing clinically with frequent imaging of the brain. Prevention. You tell your HIV patients to avoid raw and undercooked meat. You have them wash their hands after contact with raw meat, after gardening, after contact with soil. Wash fruits and vegetables well before eating them. And especially when it comes to changing cat litter, we tell our pregnant patients this too, because pregnant women are vulnerable to infection. Um, Wash hands thoroughly after changing the cat litter. Cats should be fed canned or dried food, not raw or undercooked meat. And you don't generally need to have the cat undergo testing for toxoplasmosis. You really want to look into to more of these preventive measures. When do you start toxoplasma prophylaxis? Remember PCP, you start Bactrim at CD4 less than 200 or CD4 percentage less than 14. Here, it's generally a CD4 less than 100. Um, and then Bactrim, similar to PCP, is the drug of choice. Um, and then alternatives to daily Bactrim are you can do it three days a week, generally Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You can do single sense strength tablet once a day. And then I have the other alternatives listed there, which I'm not going to go into in the interest of time. But you'll notice a, a tovaquone did make the list, um, as we saw for PCP. You wanna start primary prophylaxis when the patient, or stop primary prophylaxis when they are on ART and their CD4 count is greater than 200 for at least three months. So this is similar to PCP, stopping primary prophylaxis. Um, if you've already had toxoplasmosis and you've been on treatment, um, you know, if they've been on paramethamine plus sulfadiazine, if you don't want to keep them on lifelong suppressive therapy, the criteria for taking them off of it is if they've completed at least a year of treatment, they're asymptomatic, and their CD4 count is greater than 200 on ART for at least six months. All right, question number three. You have a 24-year-old male with HIV 
CD4 count of 75, viral load of 95,000, poorly compliant with ART, who presents with several weeks of non-bloody diarrhea, denies fever, chills, or abdominal pain, afebrile with normal vital signs on, on exam, and you send the stool for acid fast staining and you see these cysts, oocysts here that are between four and six micrometers. What is the most likely etiology behind this patient's illness? And so this is a case of cryptosporidium parvum. So let's talk about cryptosporidiosis. Many types, the one that we most commonly see in clinical practice is cryptosporidium parvum and it's a protozoal disease. And generally you see it in patients with CD4 counts less than 100. Um, in immunocompetent patients, it's usually small bowel. It also encompasses the large bowel in patients with HIV and those who are immunosuppressed. Um, and you can even see extra intestinal uh, infection. It's generally fecal oral spread, as you see in this graphic here, although you can get it through sexual activity, um, especially men who have sex with men. And how do these patients present? Typically acute or subacute watery, non-bloody diarrhea. You can have crampy abdominal pain. You can have associated nausea and vomiting. Um, and about a third of the patients will have fever. Um, and then you can see extension to uh, the biliary tract and pancreas uh, and pulmonary infections. Although again, those are in the minority when you think cryptosporidiosis, really think diarrhea, GI. And the diagnosis involves identifying these oocysts in the stool or tissue. And this is a modified acid fast stain. And as I said, oocysts are generally four to six micrometers. ART, ART, ART. There's no magic drug that works better then starting antiretroviral therapy to treat cryptosporidiosis. Once you give them their immune system back, their diarrhea will eventually resolve. Certainly you can symptomatically treat the diarrhea. You wanna replete their electrolytes. And there are drugs um, that are available, nitazoxanide being FDA approved, um, and then peromomycin, which has a response rate up to 67%, but relapse is common and the long-term success rate is only 33%. So you have these, but they should always be given in conjunction with and as a, not as a substitute for ART. Remember, more important than the drugs um, to treat the acute infection is restoring the immune system. So you have to start ART as soon as possible. Prevention, similar to toxoplasmosis, wash your hands after diapering children, handling pets after gardening, barriers during sex, especially in sexual practices that increase oral exposure to feces, don't drink water directly from lakes or rivers, and avoid raw oysters. Actually, oocysts can live in oysters for up to a couple of months. Um, so we especially tell our HIV AIDS patients to avoid raw oysters. All right, we're moving on. Now you have a 69-year-old male who developed brush and was prescribed fluconazole for five days. Further laboratory testing reveals infection with HIV. So you have a CD4 count of 195, viral load of 500,000. Patient does not want to be on ART at this time. Past history is otherwise remarkable on no medications, but does have a severe allergy to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Experiences Steven Johnson syndrome with that. So now that you've treated oral candidiasis, which of the following do you recommend? Do you recommend no OI prophylaxis? Do you recommend prophylaxis with dapsone um, and azithromycin? Do you do a combination of dapsone, pyrimethamine, azithromycin, and fluconazole? Do you do atovaquone alone? Or do you do atovaquone, azithromycin, and fluconazole? And the azithromycin is really getting at MAC or mycobacterium avium complex prophylaxis. And this fluconazole is really for the candida. Uh, so the correct answer in this case is atovaquone, which is really targeting PCP prophylaxis in this patient with CD4 count uh, less than 200. But really, I want to springboard from this case to mucocutaneous candidiasis. And due to, by and large, candida albicans can cause oropharyngeal and esophageal candidiasis. So you see the thrush coating the tongue here and involving the palate. 
You can see vulvovaginal candidiasis, but it's not as common a presentation as oropharyngeal and esophageal candidiasis. And recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, it's not necessarily indicative of HIV infection, but there's an association. So you should have a lower threshold for screening for HIV in patients with recurrent uh, vaginal, vulval vaginal candidiasis. And candida albicans, similar to PCP, you typically see in patients uh, with CD4 less than 200. With oropharyngeal candidiasis, you see these painless, creamy white plaques that are easily scraped off. Um, you can also see associated angular callosis. And with esophageal candidiasis, they'll generally present with odynophagia, retrosternal discomfort. Um, and you can see any, everything from whitish plaques to superficial ulcers on endoscopy of the esophagus. Diagnosis, it's a clinical diagnosis. Looking at it, you can make a diagnosis. To help confirm, you can do a KOH prep of scraping that showed the yeast, which you see here. And certainly histopathologic evidence of yeast forms in esophageal tissue is diagnostic. So how do we treat this? Generally, fluconazole for seven to 14 days for oropharyngeal candidiasis. Alternatives include nystatin suspension that they can do four times a day. If you worry about fluconazole resistance or lack of response, you can do any of the antifungal drugs there. I'm just going to focus on itraconazole and posaconazole. Between the two, posaconazole is just as effective and probably better tolerated than itraconazole. For esophageal candidiasis, you're going to bump up the dose and you're going to treat for longer, 14 to 21 days as opposed to 7 to 14 days. And again, you have the same array of alternatives if you have resistance or intolerance. And remember, you don't knee-jerk start uh, a workup with endoscopy for patients who present with esophageal candidiasis clinically. You give them a trial of treatment and you pursue endoscopy only if they're not responding to treatment. So prevention. Unlike the other two, PCP and Toxo that we talked about, we generally don't re recommend primary and secondary prophylaxis for oropharyngeal or even esophageal candidiasis. Why? Because the mortality is not as high with those entities. And further, the acute therapy short courses are very, very effective. And further, we're trying to avoid cost, drug interactions, and drug resistance. The, the times that we'll start HIV AIDS patients on um, like a prophylactic regimen is if they have frequent occurrences. But certainly, you should be able to take them off of it if their CD4 count is greater than 200 and they're on ART. All right, moving on to the fifth case. You have a 45-year-old male with HIV, CD4 is 70, viral load is 85,000, poorly compliant with ART, has low-grade fever, mild headache. Exam shows a temperature of 100, heart rate of 75, blood pressure of 125 over 75, and a respiratory rate of 18. Patients alert and oriented times three, minimal nuchal rigidity, and rest of the neurologic exam is non-focal. So you do a lumbar puncture, and the opening pressure is elevated at 20, really should be at 25. It should be less than 20. And you see this special stain of the CSF that is shown here. So how are you going to treat this patient? Do you just charge them home? Do you admit and start IV fluconazole? Do you admit them to the hospital and start IV amphotericin and flucytosine? Do you discharge them home with oral levofloxacin or do you just admit them for observation? And really what this case is getting at is a classic case of cryptococcal meningitis. This is somebody who comes in with a subacute presentation um, of fever, headache, neck stiffness, um, has an opening pressure on CSF, um, and has the, the classic uh, halo signs associated with cryptococcus meningitis um, on the stain here. So cryptococcosis. Cryptococcus neoformans is what we see by and large in clinical practice, although we do see cryptococcus neoformans variant GADII, which we see in immunocompetent patients, interestingly. And prior to ART, up to 8% of HIV patients developed disseminated cryptococcosis, and like toxoplasmosis, the cutoff 
that we usually see this manifest um, in AIDS patients is a CD4 count of less than 100. So again, subacute meningitis, it's not as much of an acute presentation as it is, hey, I've had this gradual onset of fever, headache, malaise that's been going on for a couple of weeks. Um, actual nuchal rigidity and photophobia is seen in a minority of patients. And so, you know, when I was training as an infectious diseases fellow, if we had an AIDS patient with a CD4 count less than 100 and they said headache, they got an LP because these patients don't have the immune system to tell you that they're sick, right? And so they'll oftentimes present with these vague symptoms and you have to take it very seriously um, and do the appropriate workup. Can you see infection outside of the CNS? Absolutely. You can see pulmonary infection. You can see skin lesions, which I've shown here. They look like molluscum lesions. And I should add CNS as well. Remember, in the differential of the toxoplasmosis for these, you know, ring enhancing lesions in the CNS, cryptococcoma can do that as well. So CSF findings, fairly nonspecific. You know, you can see mildly elevated protein. You can see a, lorm, a low to even a normal glucose. Typically, you'll see a lymphocytic pleocytosis. And the opening pressure, as I said, is elevated in 75% of patients. So an opening pressure above 20, it's usually not going to be subtle, is very telling for cryptococcus. Um, and then here you see the India ink stain um, that is positive for yeast. Um, and you can also get a CRAG or cryptococcal antigen, both in the CSF and in the blood. So those who have meningitis, you're going to have a positive serum cryptococcal antigen as well. And up to 75% of patients with cryptococcal meningitis will have an associated fungemia. So make sure you check blood cultures as well. Treatment. You want to do a combination of amphotericin B deoxycholate plus glucidazine with close monitoring of kidney function because it can cause AKI. And the reason you're adding glucidazine is to more rapidly sterilize the CSF. Um, Ampho B plus fluconazole has been studied. It's inferior to the combination of ampho and flucytosine, but it's better than doing ampho B alone. So if for some reason you can't do flucytosine, at the very least add fluconazole to amphotericin. The first several days you want to check that lumbar puncture. You want to reduce the opening pressure by 50% um, a day. And certainly if they're not tolerating those daily LPs, and if despite several days of doing this, signs of cerebral edema are not improving, it may be a good idea to get uh, a CSF shunt. Two weeks, you treat. And if there's clinical improvement and your CSF culture is negative, then you can switch to fluconazole. The guidelines recently changed to higher dose fluconazole. It used to be you wanted to switch to fluconazole 400 milligrams a day. Now it's 800 milligrams a day. If they can't do fluconazole, you can do itraconazole, but forening is really not as effective. If you have a positive culture at that two week mark, it's associated with relapse. So that's when you're going to increase to 1200 milligrams a day um, and then repeat the CFS, CSF culture again in another two weeks. So keep in mind that throughout this process, you keep doing these surveillance CSF exams. If your CSF culture is negative and they're clinically improving at that two week mark, then certainly you can switch from 800 milligrams a day to 400 milligrams a day of fluconazole. And you're gonna treat with a maintenance dose of fluconazole, lower dose after that eight weeks of consolidation. You're gonna back off to 200 a day, treat for at least a year. Um, and then when do you start ART? You generally want to delay it four to six weeks after induction therapy. And the reason is that you can have pretty severe iris, um, the immune reconstitution syndrome that I was talking about. So that's one of the primary reasons you're going to delay ART for at least four to six weeks. Prevention. You know, we already talked about this, the maintenance therapy of 200 milligrams a day um, for at least a year. Um, and then you can consider taking them off of it if they're asymptomatic and their CD4 count is greater than 100 on ART. 
primary prophylaxis for cryptococcus, just like candida, is not recommended because, relatively speaking, this disease is infrequent, there's no clear survival benefit, and the other things we've talked about, drug interactions, drug resistance, and cost. All right, now we have a 23-year-old male who presents with several weeks of watery, non-bloody diarrhea associated with crampy abdominal pain and weight loss. Patient is HIV positive with a CD4 count of 75, viral load of 85,000, and the colonoscopy shows, with biopsy, shows these results to the right. So what is the most likely etiology behind this patient's illness? This is a case of microsporidiosis. So we have several different types um, of microsporidiosis, encephalotozoan, caniculi, pelum, intestinalis, um, and then entero enterocytozoan bionusii. And this also is a protozoal organism and generally associated with CD4 counts less than 100. So depending on what species you're dealing with, you'll have different types of clinical scenarios. Um, when it comes to bionusii, this is the one that causes diarrhea with malabsorption. And that was the correct answer choice for our vignette. You can see cholangitis as well, but by and large, you see diarrhea with malabsorption. Um, intestinalis is also associated with, associated with diarrhea, but you can also see dissemination to include the eyes. So you can see a superficial keratoconjunctivitis with this as well. Um, caniculi is associated with hepatitis and cephalitis, also with disseminated infection. And then helum, like intestinalis, you can see the superficial keratoconjunctivitis, as well as respiratory disease, sinus disease, prostatic uh, disease, and dissemination. So you'll notice three of, out of the four are associated with disseminated infection. Diagnosis, you need to use a special stain, either chromotrope 2R, Ubitex 2B, um, to detect the microsporidia. Remember, the oocyst that we saw with cryptosporidiosis was four to six micrometers, microsporidiosis much smaller, one to five micrometers. If your stool is negative and there's still clinical suspicion, you can perform a small bowel biopsy with these special stains, which will confirm your diagnosis. Restore the immune system. Okay, this is going to ring a bell, just like cryptosporidiosis, where the most important treatment was restoring the immune system. The same goes for microsporidiosis. Depending on the species, there are different treatment options. So for bionusii, which we talked about, primarily presents with diarrhea, you can use fumagillin, but minimal effects amongst those with low CD4 counts, which brings me back to start ART. When you look at intestinal and disseminated infection other than E. bionusii, then you can use albendazole until they're on ART and their CD4 is above 200 for at least six months. And then ocular infection due to microsporidiosis, you can do a combination of topical fumagillin plus albendazole until their symptoms have improved. And again, they've been on ART for at least six months and their CD4 count is consistently above, above 200. No primary prophylaxis here. Ocular microsporidiosis, again, you typically want to continue treatment indefinitely. Um, but again, you want to do this, if you're going to stop, you need to do so in conjunction with an ophthalmologist and make sure that again, CD4 count greater than 200 and They've been on ART for at least six months. 25-year-old female with HIV, poorly compliant with ART, presents with several weeks of fever, weight loss, night sweats, and abdominal pain with non-bloody diarrhea. Febrile to 101, tachycardic, blood pressure is 115 over 70, respiratory rate 20. She is cachectic, has cervical lymphadenopathy, mild tenderness to palpation of the abdomen, she has a white count of four, H and H of eight and 25, platelet count of 150, alkaline phosphatase is high at 200. And she has evidence of retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy on CT. What do you think this diagnosis is? What are her blood cultures most likely to grow? And this is a case of mycobacterium avium complex. So disseminated MAC. This is a non-tuberculous mycobacteria not associated with any specific environmental exposure 
it really preys on the immunosuppressed. So here, now you have a very low CD4 count, CD4 less than 50, and it's transmitted by an inhalation or ingestion. Um, and the incidence is up to 40% for those who are not on ART or OI prophylaxis. Other than a low CD4 count, if they've had previous opportunistic infections, a super high viral load above 100,000, or if they're colonized in their GI um, or respiratory tracts, those are independent risk factors for disseminated MAC infection. So clinical constellation of symptoms, it's generally fever, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Um, you can see localized symptoms um, with cervical, which we saw in this patient, cervical or mesenteric lymphadenitis, pneumonitis, pericarditis, bone involvement, skin involvement, genital ulcers, and then CNS infection. Anemia and elevated alkaline phosphatase are clues that you may be dealing with disseminated MAC. Um, and on exam and radiographically, you can see hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy, either in the paratracheal or retroperitoneal or paraaortic region. Clinical signs and symptoms really need to, to help with your diagnosis. Um, and certainly you can check blood cultures, lymph node biopsy and bone marrow. You'll recover mycobacterium avium complex from all of those things. And you can use a DNA probe probe or high performance liquid chromatography, but you should have good results just from culturing the blood cultures, lymph node, um, or bone marrow. Treatment, at least two antimicrobacterial drugs. Clarithromycin is first line, azithromycin is alternative. Um, Ethambutol is the second drug, and you can add ripibutin. Um, at the addition of that third drug, ripibutin is associated with improved survival when added to Clary and Ethambutol. Um, you can add a fourth drug, especially if you have a super high mycobacterial load. It's an option. And then, of course, ART, unlike some of the other entities where you had to delay a little bit by two to up to six weeks, here you have to give them their immune system back immediately. So start ART ASAP. And certainly you need to be mindful of iris, but again, that is diagnosis of exclusion and symptomatic control. NSAIDs, and if NSAIDs don't work, then you can try corticosteroids. Prevention. See, if their CD4 count is 50 and they're not on ART, then you can do primary prophylaxis with azithro or Clary. If you're starting the patient on ART, and their CD4 is less than 50, you don't have to start primary prophylaxis. This is really in patients who are not on ART. And once they've already had the MAC, how long do you continue therapy? As long as they've completed at least 12 months, they're asymptomatic and their CD4 count is greater than 100 for at least uh, six months on ART, then you can stop secondary prophylaxis. All right, I'm going to finish with my final case as I know that we're running out of time. Um, you have a 31 year old female with HIV. So CD4 count is less than 100. Um, CD4 count is 70. And they present with weakness, difficulty walking. Neurologic exam reveals poor attentiveness, dysarthric speech, a right homonymous hemianopsia ataxia and left-handed weakness. Serum RPR and toxoplasma serologies are negative. So the toxoplasma IgG is negative. MRI shows non-enhancing lesions in the periventricular white matter. CSF shows two white blood cells, no red blood cells, a protein of 42 and a glucose of 78, which is the most likely cause of this patient's neurologic signs and symptoms. So this is a case of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy due to poliomavirus, which is a JC virus. And so this causes focal demyelination of the CNS. Primary infection occurs in childhood, generally asymptomatic, and then produces latent infection in the kidneys and the lymphoid organs. And pre-ART era, it affected up to 
percent of AIDS patients, and it was almost always fatal because, again, like some of the infections we've talked about, really the most important treatment is giving them their immune system back or giving them ART. And typically you see these uh, this sort of illness in patients with a CD4 less than 100, but it can occur in those on ART and those with CD4 counts greater than 100 to 200. So this is, again, very insidious. Remember, we talked about toxoplasma usually in the basal ganglia and the thalamus presenting in a subacute manner. This is a little bit longer um, with the timeline of symptoms. You're usually talking about weeks um, of an insidious onset of neurological deficits. So if you have involvement of the occipital lobe, they can have eye symptoms, so hemianopsias. If it's frontoparietal, then you see hemiparesis and hemisensory deficits. Um, and if it's in the cerebral peduncles and deep white matter, you see ataxia. <clears throat> Spinal cord involvement is rare. Up to 24% of patients have seizures, and this is especially in lesions that are adjacent to the cortex. And your lesions gradually expand along white matter tracks. And as they expand, you will start as a partial deficit and then progress to an entire territory. So you can start with unilateral leg weakness and then progress to hemiparesis over several weeks. Um, and again, the timeline contrasts with cerebral toxoplasmosis and primary CNS lymphoma, which is more days, whereas PML is several weeks. So again, progressive neurological deterioration, white matter demyelination, unlike toxo and CNS lymphoma, you don't see mass effect. CSF JC virus DNA PCR is very, very helpful. It's positive in up to 90% of patients who are not on ART. And if your MRI and CSF is unyielding for diagnosis, certainly you can pursue a, a brain biopsy where you see here oligodendrocytes with intranuclear inclusions. And again, this is the same MRI that I had shown for our patient's vignette. And so treatment, restore the immune system immediately. Um, if PML occurs on ART, you want to check the genotype for resistance and maybe change them to a more effective regimen. Um, but really recommendations for preventing and treating PML uh, due to JC virus, really no effective antiviral therapy. The main approach, I can't emphasize it enough, is to start ART immediately. I know we're running low on time. Um, so I will go ahead and stop here um, and see if anybody has any questions. And I really appreciate your time and attention. Thanks, Dr. Prakash. Um, while people think of questions, there is one in the chat, and a good one at that. Uh, it's. Uh, is microsporidius a protozoal or fungal infection? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's officially classified as a parasitic infection that's closely related to fungi, um, but really no clear distinction from there. If there are any other questions, you can unmute or put in the chat, raise hand. I'm just going to share this last screen again, just to tie it all together, because like I said, this is very helpful in helping you with your differential diagnosis. And again, this is the link to the opportunistic infection guidelines. Any other questions? Hello again from Cameroon. Hello. Thank you so much for the extensive lecture, the excellent presentation, I have to say. And the, the many cases you showed just made it so practical and help understanding. So thank you very much. There are people in our group with a few questions, so I hope we have time for that. Sure. Hello, thank you for that wonderful talk. 
You're welcome. Uh, yeah, my question concerns uh, management of uh, cryptococcal meningitis. Mm -hmm. When the, after the induction phase, your patient is still having a positive culture. You did mention that if that's the case, instead of switching the patient to 800 milligrams of fluconazole daily, that's the consolidation doses, we should continue the patient on 1,200 milligrams of uh, fluconazole. It's not very clear to me what we should do with the amphotericin B when the, after 14 days of uh, induction, the culture is still positive for cryptococcus. I have been trying to look at the uh, different literature and um, there are recommendations that we should continue with the amphotericin B if we still have a positive culture, but it's not very clear to me uh, the duration uh, for which the patient should be on additional doses of amphotericin B. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. And I would agree that especially if they're not clinically improving and their culture is still positive, it's reasonable to continue amphotericin B um, and then repeat the CSF within a week um, and then decide accordingly whether the patient is prepared to switch to fluconazole or not. Um, and that needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and again, much also has to include their, their clinical improvement. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, good afternoon, thank you for the lecture. You're welcome. So I wanted to ask about um, the chronic diarrhea and HIV patients. Um, given that most times here, we don't usually have the ability to visualize most of the cysts. Um, and we don't have the option of um, nitazosanite here. So what would you advise when you have patients who have chronic diarrhea and HIV patients? Like, do we just empirically give them abendazole and the other treatments? That you mentioned, and what other options do we have for nitazosanite? Yeah, so I would say I think for for most HIV/AIDS patients with diarrhea, um, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, regardless of the opportunistic infection, um, whether it's microspiridiosis or cryptosporidiosis, you have to give them their <laughs> immune system back. So I would say 80% of this is starting them on ART. And in my experience, most of my patients who have suffered from chronic diarrhea, the key was starting them on appropriate ART treatment. Um, and then from there, you know, if the diarrhea doesn't cease or it starts getting worse, really doing, you know, basic diagnostic testing um, from stool culture to stool ONP, um, and then I think in those cases, especially if you're in a resource limited uh, setting, um, you can try empiric therapies, um, you know, as I had talked about with cryptosporidiosis. Um, I think with cryptosporidiosis, as I said before, you do have nitazoxanide, you do have peromomycin, but they can't be used in a silo. They need to be used in conjunction with ART. Um, so never be using these therapies without prioritizing the ART. That really needs to be the basis for your treatment. And I understand in a resource limited setting, it's difficult when you don't have the diagnostic uh, testing modalities to distinguish cryptosporidiosis from uh, some of your other infections. And in those cases, I think on a case by case basis, you can try some of the other empiric modalities um, like nitazoxanide, peromomycin. Um, but in HIV AIDS patients, if you've excluded infectious causes of diarrhea, then certainly things like Imodium are reasonable. But again, I think that that's only once you've excluded other sources of infection. Any other questions? <laughs> 
Yes, a uh, couple more from Cameroon Phil. So, so uh, for the management of cryptococcal meningitis, I, I wanted to know, do we have uh, a particular advantage or is it just related to the toxicity profile between liposomal and amphotericin B and deoxycholate and amphotericin B? Right here, we use deoxycholate. Are we losing something by doing that? I don't think you're losing anything. I think the benefit to liposomal amphotericin is preserving kidney function. Um, I, I would say that that would be the primary benefit to using liposom liposomal amphotericin over ampoV deoxycholate. Okay, in some parts of the country, unfortunately, amphotericin B is still not used and fluconazole alone at doses of about 2,000 milligrams are given to patients with cryptococcal meningitis. What are your comments about such practices? And Yeah, I think that, you know, in a resource limited setting, um, I think it is reasonable. Um, and I think that, you know, as long as you're doing the lumbar punctures um, and you're staying on top of the CSF cultures, if you don't have access to amphotericin, then I think high-dose fluconazole is reasonable. I see. Now, concerning steroids in PCP, you recommended using ABG, PAO2 less than 70, AA greater than 35. A, having ABGs is not so easy, unfortunately. Can you formulate a recommendation based on SPO2? Yeah, I would say I don't have a hard and fast cutoff based on guidelines, um, but if you have a patient who is fairly hypoxic, then I think the threshold for starting corticosteroids should be very low. Again, I don't have a hard and fast cutoff of what translates um, from a PAO2 of 70 to um, you know a hypoxic patient and how much oxygen they're on. I think that's a judgment call. Um, but if you have a patient who has moderate to severe illness um, and moderate to severe hypoxia, then I would go ahead and treat with corticosteroids. I think your threshold should be very low for starting them. Okay, thank you. Now, finally, concerning uh, PML and JC virus. So the recommendations definitely begin ART as soon as possible and uh, hopefully get some improvement with that. But any comments about uh, some some people recommend uh, the use of uh, the the importance of serotonin receptors in the pathophysiology or pathogenesis of PML? Any recommendations concerning uh, using serotonin blockers in these patients, and do we expect to see any benefits from that? I'm not aware of any data around that. I'll be honest with you. You know, from my perspective and everything that I've read and our experience with PML patients the focus needs to be on the ART. Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you, Vidya, this is Bavia. You know, Hi, Bavia. <laughs> thank you so much for doing such an excellent session. You know, we really appreciate it. And you can see this, uh, this, this is a very pertinent topic and uh, thank you, Dr. Shinda and the, uh, you know, our uh, internal medicine resident group at Mingo Baptist Hospital. You know, everybody's so excellent with such great questions. So I really appreciate it. And with there, your talk was excellent. Thank you so much for doing the talk and the Q&A session, you know. And uh, thanks for, the, for all the other attendees too, who were able to join uh, and also had some questions. So really appreciate it. And Pranati for the moderation. Um, all right, everyone have a great day and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.